Well, greetings, test takers. This is Series 7 Guru coming to you from my studio here in fabulous Las Vegas with another uh, practice final, very popular on the channel. So we'll be explicating this uh, practice final. I'll turn the th uh, thing over for 30 minutes. So these usually take about 90 minutes. So you can hit pause, take a break if you'd like. Uh, I would uh, hit pause before each question. Do your answer, hit play. Uh, see if your answer is the same as my answer to be determined whether we're correct. <laughs> so we'll see how we uh, do at the end when we score it up. But uh, explication just means instead of just talking about the question, and the right answer, we'll try and, you know, add some color to it. Uh, you know, what should you be prepared for in terms of the test itself? Uh, this will make the uh, seventh practice final that is available to you on the YouTube channel on the series seven uh, practice exam playlist. So we have six different playlists for the series seven. One of them, just a playlist with videos of uh, practice questions. So lots of practice questions for you. Um, best free supplement to your paid study materials is the YouTube channel, my YouTube channel. And if you don't already have the Kaplan Q bank, I highly recommend it with the guru 10 discount code. You can bring it in at about 60 bucks. And I also recommend the uh, Kaplan series seven quick sheets. Those are pretty nice too. That's a uh, laminated three pages of, you know, high risk, uh, high risk areas, high probability, I guess I should say on the exam. And that's about $19 with a 10% discount. That's what, uh, $2 off that buck 90, something like that. Uh, for that commercial, uh, Kaplan is kind enough, shout out to Kaplan to allow me to give you a free look like this on Kaplan content. All right, so let's get started. A client age 27 is new to investing. That's important has 20,000 saved thus far and wishes to allocate $400 towards investing monthly. I'd probably miss this because I'm going to already think it should be dollar cost averaging, but let's see. His goal is to purchase a new home three to five years. So short-term high, short-term uh, time horizon. Which of the following is the most suitable recommendation? Uh, invest in a money market mutual fund to build up more cash reserves. That sounds pretty reasonable. Uh, B, I try and uh, make this as big as it can. I know some of you are on smartphone and just using audio files. So I, I forget, but I try and keep that in mind by making the screen as large as I possibly can and uh, by trying to read you both the questions and the, the uh, answer choices. Opening long margin account to take advantage of leverage that margin purchases can create using small amounts of money. No. Invest in both equity and corporate debt mutual funds so their portfolio of stocks and bonds is established. You know, I'm prejudicial. That sounds good. But almost always on the exam, when they say somebody's saving to buy a house, it's going to be a money market fund. Uh, use leveraged index funds. Absolutely not. You should know that leveraged index funds are trading vehicles, not really in long-term investment vehicles. So by process of elimination, the answer is A. And you should definitely know what's in a money market fund, which is high quality debt uh, maturing in less than 12 months. And you should definitely know that would include T-bills, uh, bankers' acceptances, commercial paper, and negotiable jumbo CDs. All the following is included in a municipal bond resolution, except you're going to get lots of mini bond questions. You could get as many as a 20 muni bond questions on your exam. So make sure you spend time on uh, muni bonds. Uh, any call provisions? that would allow the issuer to redeem the bonds before their scheduled maturity. That's called the call date, the call date. That's definitely going to be in the resolution. Restrictive covenants that are binding on the issuer. Absolutely. An authorization to sell the securities. By the way, the resolutions are the set of promises that are typically found in the uh, trust indenture. An authorization. Uh, yeah, remember, we're going to have a bond council who gives us a legal opinion that they have the legislative authority to borrow the money. Uh, compensation paid to the underwriters, no, that would not be found in the uh, bond resolution. That would actually be found in the official statement. So, you know, try and uh, keep those documents uh, separate in your mind's mind in your brain housing group. An officer of a bank wants to purchase a new issue. Which of the following statements is true? So, you know, we have rules about IPO allocations and there are what we call restricted persons, right? So you may not purchase a new issue because she's considered a restricted person. Yeah, the idea here is that we're going to try and compromise her 
uh, by throwing IPO allocations her way. And then hopefully the bank would give us some trading business. So she's restricted. She may not purchase a new issue unless she wants to purchase a small relation. No, she may purchase a new issue because anyone is allowed. To, by the way, if any part, part of a statement is false, the whole statement's false. And that's not true. They are restricted persons. The main ones they test on are not so much bank officers. It's your immediate family member, the associated person of the broker dealer, their immediate family members, uh, fiduciaries, accountants, and uh, um, uh, uh, attorneys to the underwriter, and um, and uh, undisclosed investment entities. So uh, she may purchase new issue because there's no bank rules prohibit. No, it's going to be she's a restricted person. FINRA 2210, communications with the public. So you uh, definitely should uh, understand there's three buckets, if you will, three types of communication. There's institutional communication. We don't really care about institutional communication in terms of a test issue because institutional investors are capable of protecting their own interests, their own assets. Uh, but we certainly care about retail communication. Retail communication would be to uh, more than 25 uh, retail investors in a 30-day period. We definitely want to know that. And re, uh, retail communications require a principal approval pre-distribution. And we have correspondence. Correspondence would be to 25 or fewer uh, retail investors in a 30-day period that we require a principal approval pre or post. So all these other things, B, C, and D, go into one of those buckets. So correspondence is that separate category. Your customer has made a margin purchase of 100 shares at 50. Two days later, before the customer has met his call, the current market value is 60. How much must your customer now deposit? Well, there's been no change in your margin call. You need to put in $2,500. So we don't do a mark and let you slide on what you initially need to deposit now. So that's going to be $2,500. Uh, please note that if you don't pay, then we're going to sell you out. And if we sell you out, you never pay for this purchase. That means you took a free ride, a ride you didn't pay for. And if you get uh, the money sent to you, so in this case, that would be what, $1,000? You bought it at $5,000. We sold it for six. We sell you out six, let's suppose. There's a thousand dollar profit. I have to give that to you, but then I freeze your account. And for the next 90 days, you have no credit privileges. Your account is frozen in terms of credit privileges. We will still trade with you, but we won't uh, uh, extend credit. When you hear the firm's traders talking about institutions trading with a lack of transparency, they are probably referring to. So institutional investors like to trade anonymously amongst themselves, and they do that in the dark pools. And that's where people can trade anonymously. The bulletin board, no, that's a part of the over-the-counter market. The third market is listed securities traded over-the-counter. So if they would have said listed securities over-the-counter, that would have been C. And then over-the-counter market are negotiated quote-driven markets. That would include NASDAQ and the bulletin board, as well as all debt-denominated securities. They, too, trade over-the-counter in a negotiated uh, quote-driven market. By the way, direct trading between institutions is called the fourth market. Uh, potential investment company clients. Investment company is just the fancy word for mutual funds. So that's what the fancy word for a mutual fund. Uh should investigate, should be advised to investigate the fund by looking at which of the following, which of the following, the investment policy of the mutual fund. Well, I would prefer that says investment objective, but you know, that's not really available to me. So I don't know what I'm going to do with that one. Let's see. I think I would, I would say yes, because I I'm thinking investment objective, investment policy close enough for me to say, I'm going to take that. What do you care about the number of shares outstanding? That has nothing to do with it. The number of shares outstanding is going to fluctuate, right? Because they're going to be either if it's an open end fund continually offering new shares to the public. And if it's closed in, it'll be fixed. But that has nothing to do with the uh, invest investigation. Uh, the custodial bank, no. Uh, the portfolio of the securities, yeah, you'd be interested in one and four. That's kind of a funky question. Um, stop orders can be used for each of the following except. Uh, this is a good question. They love the accept format to establish a stock position. Absolutely. You know, if I'm a technical practitioner, I will put a sell stop below the support line to establish a short stock position. If I'm a technical, technical practitioner, technical analysis, I put a buy stop 
above the resistance line to establish a stock position. So A is definitely true. To protect a profit, absolutely. So I say, hey, it's been a good ride. The stock is up. I'd like to put a sell stop. Stock's at 90. Let's put a sell stop at 88 to protect our profit. Absolutely. Uh, to protect a short position. I say, hey, we shorted it at 140. Now it's 80. Why don't we put in a buy stop to protect that profit? Definitely. To walk in a specific price to close out the position. Now that would be an option. Because remember when the stop order trigger gets pulled, we don't know what the next trade is going to be. So D. By the way, the, the, I don't like here that they also don't say to uh, stop a loss, which is the number one use of this, right? So that's not in our answer set. But the number one use of so three things, stop a loss, protect a profit, establish a stock position for the big three. A customer opens the following option position. He goes long one kale October 70 put at four and a quarter and short one October 80 put at 10. So you have to be able to do a couple of things. Hold on just a sec. I guess. Sneeze here. You should be able to identify this as a spread. You know, a spread is when you're long and short, the same type of contract. And what you're spreading, spread means difference, the difference in the premiums. So uh, I paid, uh, brought in 10 for the 80 put, and I paid out four and a quarter for the 70 put. I'm a pretty smart guy because I realized that if this uh, doesn't work out, if it's not 80 or higher, this is a credit put spread. And somebody sticks it to me at 80, at least I can turn around and stick it to the next guy at 70. So my max loss is going to be that 10 points if the contracts get exercised. That's not what I want. Less whatever my net credit's already in my account. So uh, I'm terrible at arithmetic. So I'm just going to take the 10 minus four and a quarter. And that means my credit is $575. Uh, my loss is going to be the difference. So if I shop my answer set here, I know it's either C or D because I should know that a credit spread, my maximum gain is the net credit, net credit, excuse me. Uh, so that means it's either C or D. Uh, 425 loss. Well, thank you very much. I don't have a choice. Now I got to decide is the break even 75, 75 or 74, 25. So we have a mnemonic memory aid for that push, put, subtract from the higher. So I'm going to take the 80, the higher strike. I'm going to subtract the net premium five and three quarters. And I get a break even of 74.25. When a broker dealer sends a communication to its customers that the sweep account used for customer credit balance will be changed from one money market fund to a different one, the communication must include. So, you know, we've been using a, you know, third party for most major firms have their own proprietary mutual fund for the sweep. But if we're using a third party, and we want to change it, or maybe we want to get rid of our proprietary version, whatever the case may be, uh, what we're going to have to provide is a tabular comparison of the nature and amount of the fees charged. So and the answer here is A. Again, I think low probability, low probability. Uh, Popular Investment Securities, a FINRA member firm, produces short videos describing the general characteristics of different types of securities. Uh, periodically an intertitial <laughs> appears during the video. I don't even know what that is. So when, when we get a word we're not familiar with, I'm going to now have to depend on the context of the question to try and figure out what my answer is. So it sounds like to me that's a fancy word for there's going to be a commercial in this video. Anyways, under FINRA rules on communications with the public, uh, I think, uh, let's see what my choices are. Video presentations of any kind must be filed with FINRA within 10 days after first use. Well, I, I think if I say that's true, then I'm saying this is retail communication. So, you know, I'm, I'm just shopping my answer set here. And so I'm thinking what I'm thinking this thing is, is like a pop-up is what I'm thinking. I have no idea. I'll, I'll Google it after we're done. Anyway, so, uh, uh, they may not be used in public communication without the consent of the viewer. No, man, if that were true, there'd be no videos, right? If you're watching my video YouTube channel, you know, you're going to get these, uh, these ads. Um, I had a guy who said, Dean, I love the channel. There's just so many ads. I go, well, I don't like them either. I pay 12 bucks a month 
to get rid of the ads so I don't have to watch them. You can pay 12 bucks. And if you're on your SIE and you're going all the way through to your 66, 12 bucks a month, then you don't have to watch the ads. That's what, $48. He said, well, I'll suffer. I said, well, you're pretty blessed at that suffering. <laughs> right? So um, I think there's a lot more people that are really suffering. Anyways, the uh, as long as the president is strictly generic, filing is not required. There, no, that's just, we could toss that one out. The appearance uh, of the pop-up, I'm assuming that's a pop-up, defines the video's retail communication required filing. I'm going to go for that. Let's see if I get that right. Now, remember, there's three buckets, retail communication, uh, correspondence, and institutional communication. Which of the following statements is true of the good faith deposit submitted by interested bid bidders? So, you know, in a uh, competitive underwriting, the municipality might require syndicates who are interested to post a good faith deposit. No, there used to be a lot, lot more questions on muni minutia than there is uh, nowadays. They, you know, and nobody calls their cool uh, calls their Q bank. Nobody wants to say they got less questions. So on the actual exam, I haven't had somebody tell me they've seen anything about a good faith deposit in in years. But it is usually one to two percent of the total value. So that's true. So I need one. So I got a 50-50. It's uh, usually 10% of the par value. No, I mean, one and two are mutually exclusive. So it can't be, you know, two. California, for example, if they do a $2 billion underwriting, that would say 200 million. No. If the bid's unsuccessful, it is returned to the underwriting syndicate. So as the competing syndicates lose, this is saying we have to give back the good faith deposit. Certainly. You can get this right with reduction to the ridiculous. If that were not true, then the issuer wouldn't have to underwrite the bonds, right? They just keep the good faith deposit. So one test taking trick is called reduction to the ridiculous. Uh, this is one and three. Two friends would like to open a joint account and have, but have the tax filed under the name of the non-employed individual. Uh, that sounds kind of some like some shenanigans to me here. So uh, I'm going to be predisposed, you know, projecting the answer I'm looking for. I think I'm going to say it's prohibited or I'm going to want to have some more information. Uh, so uh, that could be done with a joint account with a transfer and death designation. Uh, no. An account opened as a partnership. No. A joint tenants with rights or survivorship with the social company of the designated person used. Yeah, that sounds like the way to get it done if we're going to do it. A tenants in common count with percentage ownership. No, uh, that's a funky question. Again, I don't really like that question, but make sure on the test, you can certainly distinguish between joint tenants with rights or survivorship and tenants in common and what happens uh, when a party dies. Very testable. Minimum distributions for an IRA. Now they're not on the test. It's going to be straightforward, just 72. You're not going to have to make the distinction uh, between, you know, whether it's the April of the month or if it's the 72 but it is April 1st of the year where you turn 72. So I would just know the 72, you can choose to draw down at 59 and a half. You must to do required minimum distributions at 72. Um, I would know if you get out early, it's a 10% penalty. I would know Ross don't have an RMD, no required minimum distribution. So fly high on the retirement stuff. Don't get too much in the weeds. Rollover has got to be done in 60 days. You should definitely know that Ginny Mays pay monthly. It's the only investment that pays interest in principal monthly. It's fully taxable and it has the full faith and credit of the United States government. Uh, which of the following is not permitted to open an IRA? So again, projecting the answer, I'm thinking, okay, well, you got to have earned income to fund an IRA unless you're using the spousal, uh, non-working spouse kind of thing. So that's kind of what I'm thinking when I'm projecting what I think uh, the answer is. Uh, a corporate uh, officer covered by a 401k so I'm looking for something that says you need earned income. A self-employed attorney has a Keogh plan. You know, if you're a senator, you come up with the idea, we name it after you. So Senator Keogh came up with this idea, and Senator Keogh is no longer here to protect his uh, Keogh plans, and Senator Roth is not here either. Uh, individual whose sole income, there we go. Remember, you got to have earned income. Individual whose sole income consists of dividends and capital gains. Uh, which of the following are uh, true? Which of the following regarding corporate debentures are true. So corporate debentures are unsecured debt. You should definitely know that corporations capitalize themselves with equity and debt. 
you know, they don't have to issue debt if they don't want to, but they certainly have to issue common stock. So corporate debentures uh, are certificates of indebtedness. Well, there's a bond certificate, so I kind of like that. You should definitely know it doesn't give the bondholder owner. You should definitely know that two is not true. So if we eliminate two, that takes care of one because we're going to have to take one. They are unsecured bonds issued to finance capital expenditures or raise capital. That sounds pretty reasonable. Uh, so I think I want one and three. They're the most senior security. Now, remember, the most senior security a corporation can issue is secured debt. Secured debt. So one and three. A municipal bond has a call provision. So the call provisions allows the municipality to refinance, to call in the higher interest bonds and refinance them by issuing uh, lower uh, interest uh, cost bonds. Uh, they make the bonds less attractive to investors because a call would terminate the interest payments. Well, I kind of like that because, I mean, the call provision is advantageous to the issuer, not the bond holder, right? Place of floor and how low the price will decline? No, I mean, it could go bankrupt. It could default. No. Make the bond more attractive. Now, test-taking trick, we know it's either A or C because they say exact opposite things, right? It can't be less attractive and more attractive. It makes the bond more attractive because the bonds are going to be called at a premium. Well, not necessarily. I mean, usually the call protection would consist of two things, the time and the price. But, you know, that price, it could be callable at par. So I don't think so. I have no effect. Don't ever take warm, fuzzy bailout answers like, you know, you can't figure it out. No, the call provision is advantageous to the issuer. So uh, I would definitely know that uh, zero coupon bonds are not callable and uh, treasury securities are not callable. So if you're worried about call risk, you might want to do that. Uh, customer purchases to QRS, doesn't matter. You know, break even is always expressed on a per share basis. This is not a lecture, so I'm not going to open a T. I'm not going to be teaching this as I go along. We're just simply going through you hitting pause and seeing if you can come up with the answer. If you're struggling, uh, let me know in the comments if you'd like. And if you'd like, I'll link the appropriate, you know, carve out lectures for the subject areas that are you know, we're covering. So in the video description, I don't know, we're in this for in this thing for uh, about 18 minutes so far. I put, you know, timestamp and then tell you where the lecture can be found. Anyways, again, we're buying some calls here. Uh, we're buying some puts. So this looks like to me a straddle. So the four things you got to be able to do on a straddle is identify it. Then you got to be able to calculate the break evens. It's the only one on series seven that has two break evens. So I'm going to combine the premiums. I'm out two, I'm out two and a half, I'm out four and a half. And so my upside break even is going to be call up 34 and a half. And my downside break even put down is 30. Again, I'm going to use my calculator because I'm terrible at arithmetic and I certainly don't want to miss something because I can't do arithmetic. So uh, I'm going to say it's 25 and a half as my downside break even. And 34 and a half is my upside break even. So one and four. I would also know we're expecting volatility. You know, the direction's uncertain. And I would know we make money if it's outside. The market price of the stock is outside that break even. Uh, which of the following can take place in a cash account? You should definitely know that new issues are considered ineligible for margin. It's considered a new issue 30 days from the effective date. And so that is out. No can do. Uh, short sale of stock. All short sales must indeed be conducted in a uh, margin account. So you can't do a short sale of stock in a cash account. Uncovered option writing? Nope. Borrowing money? Nope. So yeah, if you want to buy a new issue, you're going to have to do that in your cash account. Cash account is where you intend to pay in full. A margin account is where you intend to pay part of the purchase price and you'd like the broker dealer to lend you the balance. Uh, municipal bonds known as dollar bonds are generally quoted. So we're either going to quote bonds uh, based on their price or on their yield to maturity. So as a percentage or par or their yield to maturity. So you could, by process of elimination, uh, eliminate yield to, well, yield to call, we might quote it on yield to call if it's trading at a premium, but there's no such thing as net yield. Most bonds, dollar bonds, are quoted as a percentage of par, right? A premium, discount, whatever the case may be. Uh, serial bonds would be quoted on a basis, on their basis, their yield of maturity. Uh, which of the following may be effective when a company buys machinery for cash? 
Uh, I've been thinking about doing a little lecture on balance sheets. And uh, if it's not already up in the playlist, uh, just let me know if you're interested in that, because I already have the a balance sheet and income statement I've been sitting on for a long time. I think I'm going to actually just do a uh, carve out of 30 minutes on a balance sheet. Anyway, so uh, what's going to be affected? Uh, shareholder equity. Uh, no, my, my net worth is the same when I buy something. I always think if you're struggling a little bit, just think of your personal situation. I mean, does your net worth change when you uh, buy something? No, you're just exchanging an asset called cash for some other asset. In this case, maybe a longer term asset, right? That's what the machinery is going to be. So your net worth, shareholder equity is net worth. That doesn't change. Your current assets certainly change because remember, you're turning the cash into the machinery. So that's going to change. Uh, total liabilities? Uh, no. It says you're paying for cash, so you didn't borrow any money to do that. Uh, working capital, yeah, you should definitely know that working capital is current assets minus current liabilities. And we just changed the current assets. And by changing the current assets, we're going to change the working capital. So that's two and four. Uh, again, the test is pretty light on balance sheet stuff. You'll get more of that on the 66 if you're you know going to move on uh, than you do on the seven. And that's one reason... Uh, I cover it when I explicate the content outline, but I don't have a real carve out on it. You know, because the, 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 the test assumes you have a research department doing this, that you're not actually the one who's going to be doing any of this. Uh, which of the following is not an advantage of buying listed call options as compared to buying the stock? The call has a time value beyond an intrinsic value that dissipates. You know, if you're going to trade options for me, I'd like you right, make you write a thousand times. Options are a wasting asset. Time value erodes. You know, at expiration, the, contract, the option contract is only worth its intrinsic value. If the option contract has intrinsic value, the option contract will be exercised. If the option contract has no intrinsic value, the option contract will expire worthless. So that means, you know, when you buy an option contract, that's what this is saying, you got to be right about three things, direction, how far, and the timing. And so that's not an advantage, that's a disadvantage. When you buy the stock, you just have to be right about one thing, direction, and you have forever to be right about that. Uh, buying a call allows greater leverage than buying the underlying stock, yeah. You know, if I buy a 50 call at uh, five and the stock goes to uh, uh, 60, I've doubled my money, right? Now the five is worth 10. If I buy the stock at uh, 55, it goes to 60, I make 500. Buying a call has a lower dollar loss, yeah, you're just out the premium, right? Stride price or lower, call expires, so pretty easy to qualify you. Is this money you can afford to lose? Uh, yeah, to buy the stock, you have to buy, you know, the round lot would be 100 shares at like Apple 140. That's 140 grand. But to buy an Apple 140 call would cost you about 900 bucks, perhaps. So yeah, A. Hey. Which of the following does not participate in the syndicate, the joint account for municipal underwriting? So, you know, there's going to be a manager, you know, there's going to be perhaps uh, selling group members. So they're kind of asking you about these participants in the syndicate. Uh, the bank dealing in municipal securities. Yeah, we might have a bank as a member of our syndicate. You know, uh, banks and broker dealers uh, are involved in this business. You know, banks don't need to join FINRA. If all they want to do is do bonds, mini bonds, most of them do. So a bank would certainly be in there. Uh, the issuing municipality. No, they wouldn't be the syndicate, right? The issuer is not a member of the syndicate. A municipal broker dealer? Certainly, certainly. A financial advisor acting as a municipal securities dealer? Yes. Uh, I think this kind of kind of funky. What I would know about the syndicate is the manager, who's first among equals and is a member of the syndicate, then syndicate members, and then syndicate members may build their own selling group. And I would know that selling group members are not members of the syndicate. They have no liability. And then I would know the components of the spread, the management fee, the additional takedown, the selling concession, and I would know the additional takedown and the selling concession is the total takedown. And I think I said that selling group members are never liable, whether it's what divided syndicate or undivided syndicate, whether it's divided Western or undivided Eastern. Uh, ABC Corporation has an 8% convertible bond that is callable at 102. Uh, currently, the bond is trading at 101. It has a conversion price of 40. I can't stress how important this is to you on your exam. The minute you get the conversion price, you need to establish the conversion ratio. We, you know, almost always, we may not need it in this question, but, you know, almost always we're going to have to figure out how many shares we can get. So I'm going to take my calculator, 1,000. 
uh, divide by 40, I find out the conversion ratio is 25. Uh, the common stock is trading at 39 and a half. So uh, ABC announces a call at 102. So 102 is 1,020. To realize the greatest profit, the bondholder should. So I'm going to take the 25 times 39 and a half. And uh, that looks like if I did the 25 shares I'm entitled to, I'd get 987.50. And 102 sounds like a better deal, right? So I'm going to take whatever gives me the biggest money. So I'm going to say A. Uh, by the way, the, the, the issuer knows that that's what you're going to do. Uh, that's my little uh, egg timer telling me we're at 30 minutes. I'm going to reset. These explications, like I said, that's what we do on the channel. I do long form stuff. So, you know, when I first started the channel, people told me, oh, nobody's going to watch a video for longer than five or 10 minutes. Well, uh, that's not true. Uh, the channel's coming up on a million views in our two years, or we're almost two years old now. And anyways, but you could always hit pause. So, you know, you don't have to, you know, go through the whole video at the time. You can take it, you know, in smaller bites. Uh, I would add to that, though, you do want to kind of try and build up your concentration level. Because on the test, right, it's not going to be you know, <laughs> five or 10 minute videos. It's a, a sustained period of uh, concentration. I'll, I try and bring these in about 90 minutes. So let's see. A uh, margin account is restricted by 5,000. So, you know, margin is not a big deal on the test. Maybe three or four questions on margin. If you tell me you missed the mark because of margin, I'm going to say you had bigger problems elsewhere. Uh, but that being said, uh, you know, we should have a general understanding. So restriction is uh, below 50%. And when you're restricted, what it means is if you sell securities, you can only have half the proceeds. That's the restriction. And, you know, or what do you want to think of that as retention? Uh, and you want to bring it to Reg T so that you're not restricted any longer. So you can either, uh, you know, give me some cash to pay down the debit. You know, if you give me 5,000 in cash, that would pay down the debit. It's always going to be twice in securities, whatever cash would have been. So you would uh, give me $10,000 of fully paid marginal stock. Which of the following best describes the current yield of a bond? A current yield, very testable, is what an investment pays you divided by what it costs you, right? So A, you should definitely be able to do that on your exam. For stocks, remember, it would be the annual dividend. All the following are advantages of buying an option contract. I think we've seen pretty much the same thing. Uh, time value dissipation. Uh, no, nope, that's not a good thing. Leverage is a good thing. Limited risk is a good thing. Uh, to position against a written option. Uh, that's kind of fancy. I kind of like this one. This is kind of a, you know one of those questions where you go, what the heck does that mean? Well, what that means is you might want to buy an option. Uh, do, for example, a credit call spread or a credit put spread by taking part of your premium and buying an option. So if somebody calls it away from you, you can call it away from the next guy. Or somebody sticks it to you, you can stick it to the next guy. So I think what that means is uh, buy an option to implement a spread rather than having a naked option. That sounds pretty reasonable. So remember, they're asking me advantages. If I were your registered option principal, I wouldn't write you let you write a naked call. I'd say, why would you do that? Why don't you take part of your premium from the short call and buy the longer uh, higher strike call? Do a credit call spread. All the following are benefits of a traditional IRA, except, so the traditional IRA, except. The earnings, by the way, again, fly high on these questions uh, about uh, traditional IRAs, uh, all IRAs. I Don't get in the weeds too much on these uh, retirement questions. So uh, it benefits. The earnings accumulate tax deferred. That's true of all retirement plans. So you should have been struggling with that. Uh, the contributions may be tax deductible. Yeah, that's a good thing. That uh, no penalty is charged for failing to withdraw funds. You should definitely know that's not true. That there's a required minimum distribution. So that the funds may be withdrawn without penalty for certain exemptions is true. So the answer is C. Uh, with no other positions, an investor sells DWQ 45 calls this is a very dumb bear, a very dumb bear. So I did my opening sale for four. The calls are exercised when the stock is at 47.25. So I'm going to have to go in the open market and buy the stock at 47.25.
and deliver it at 45. You know, I want you to make every customer write a big boy or big girl letter saying, do you understand when you're short a call contract, whether it's covered or uncovered, in this case, uncovered, that you are going to have to deliver the stock at less than the current market price. So if we buy that stock at 47.25 and we deliver it at 45, we're going to lose two and a quarter. Uh, we got four originally. So four minus two and a quarter. It looks like I'm going to have a profit because I got still have money left over, right? I got one and a half left over. And we did this on four contracts. Each of those contracts governing 100 shares, right? So we sold it for four. Uh, we got exercise when it's at 47.25. So we bought the stock at 47.25. We delivered at 45. So we lost two and a quarter, right? We lost two and a quarter. We got four originally. So if we take four minus the two and a quarter, that's uh, 175 times four times 100 because that's the multiplier. And that is $700 a gain because right? we still have money left over. By the way, you could have just done the break even. 45 plus four is 49. And uh, I'm bearish. I want it below that. 47 and a quarter is, uh, you know, what, two and a quarter below that. So you could have done it that way as well. A document that allows investors in class A shares to receive a break point. Uh, break points are good quantity discounts. Uh, break point sales are bad. That's where you try and maximize the commission. Uh, that's called a letter of intent that for 13 months can be backdated 90 days, right? It's uh, unilateral, meaning you can't hurt the customer, so you should sign it. So that's called a letter of intent, very testable. Interest rate risk is intrinsic to all types of fixed income investments, okay? Including debt securities and preferred stock. When interest rates go up, market prices decline. Well, thank you. They're giving me all kinds of free information. They're telling me about the inverse relationship. I wouldn't count on the test to give you so much free information. Although not commonly associated with common stock, some common stock investments are subject to interest rate risk. So uh, this would be a company that is borrowing money, right? Because if you have a lot amount of debt on your balance sheet and interest rates go up, your cost of funds is going up and that could affect your, uh, your earnings. The common stock of which of the following companies would be most affected by interest rate risk. The fancy for, word for this it's counterintuitive is a company that trades on equity, meaning on the balance sheet, they have a small amount of equity and a large amount of debt. So common stock shares that has recently filed for bankruptcy, nope. Common stock of a growth uh, investment company growth funds, nope. Common stock of high tech, nope. Yeah, public utility companies borrow lots of money. If you look at a balance sheet on a public utility company, you would see that they have a lot of uh, bonds that they've issued. So that's going to be that. By the way, I also know utilities are defensive stocks. An investor holding a broad-based uh, portfolio feels the market, which has slowed recently, may be poised for a brief fall before it continues its upward trend. The investor does not want to incur a cost of selling a portion of their holdings or assume the risk of mistiming the market. A possible strategy may be. So, you know, when we are long, we're either going to sell a call to generate additional income or we're going to buy a put to put in a floor. So I think the appropriate hedging strategy here would be to buy an index put option. And what I'm hoping is that if the market goes down, the value of the put I bought uh, goes up so I can offset some of that risk. And determining the suitability of an investor in a direct participation program, the registered rep should evaluate each of the following except. You should definitely know that uh, partnerships have limited liquidity. So I'm projecting an answer saying, okay, I think I'm gonna get asked something about partnerships uh, having limited liquidity because you need the permission to be admitted or emitted. The investor's ability to commit the funds for a lengthy period. That is definitely something we can, should consider because we said it doesn't have liquidity. So A is true. The investor's ability to borrow the required amount that will make up the initial investment. Eh, that seems kind of weird. The investor's financial ability to lose the entire amount of their investment always, right? Called capital risk. All these things have capital risk. The current and future needs of their future tax needs. Yeah, remember 
partnerships have a flow through of income and losses. And if we have losses, they can only be offset with passive income. So that's true. So based on process of elimination, I'm going to say B, you know, we don't, you know, it's, that's just a weird thing. Uh, again, sometimes be careful. You're not picking up on the accepts. What you want to know is the truthful information, A, C, and D. Uh, a fill and kill. So we have fill or kill as a qualifier. It means I want it all and I want it now. So I should have been able to eliminate two. You know, two would be for immediate or cancel. So once I get rid of two, that's helpful because I'm not sure about the grammar on one, but now that takes care of that for me. Now I got to take one. Must be executed in one attempt. Yeah, so fill or kill means I want it all. I want it now. So it's going to be one and three. Uh, a feasibility study. So the minute I hear feasibility study, I'm thinking, okay, projecting the correct answer. I'm thinking this is about a muni bond and it's about a revenue bond because revenue bonds are the ones that have uh, feasibility studies. Uh, after extensive, the city of Mount Vernon decided to issue bonds that depend on the earning requirements of the facility, user fees. All of following statements are true except the bonds are backed by the full faith and credit of the city of Mount Vernon. No, that would be a geo bond. Boom. The city is issuing revenue bonds. Yes. Remember, and then we'd want to have the legislative authority, the bond council saying that this uh, industrial development agency or whatever it is has the authority to do this. Uh, the investor risk depends on the characteristics of the project. Yeah. If the user fees are insufficient, the bonds are going to default. Rental services collected from shop owners will pay the bonds debt service. Yeah. So yeah, remember, I would, uh, you know, I don't know where you're at in your study ever, but I highly recommend you take a sheet of paper and fold it in half. And on one side, write all the terms associated with geo bonds. And on the other side, all the terms associated with revenue bonds. Because a big part of the exam is being able to distinguish between revenue and geo bonds. And a limited partner invests $100,000 in a movie production limited partnership with a non-recourse note. So non-recourse means I'm telling the partnership to borrow money on my behalf to make my investment. Right? So... Uh, I'm going to put in 400,000, but since I'm not at risk for the 300, my cost basis is 100. Now, it was recourse, and that means the investment doesn't pay the loan. The partnership doesn't pay the loan. The bank has recourse to make me pay the money back. If I were at risk for the 300, here I'm not. Non recourse means I'm not at risk. Then it would have been 400. So, three letters non recourse or recourse. Non recourse, my cost basis in this question is 100. Recourse with the 300, it's 400. So uh, they liquidate and I receive 100,000. Well, I just said my cost base is 100,000. I got my 100,000 back. And so I don't think I lost any money, right? And partnerships, what I'm interested in is a return on my capital. You're only gonna get two or two or three partnerships max. All the test prep vendors go way, way overkill on you know uh, uh, partnerships. Mainly know the, know the types, know the liquidity. Uh, don't get too in the weeds on the tax things like that. Uh, there would be an exception if that was a mortgage because the recourse would be on the mortgage. Uh, one of your clients has a margin account containing long and short positions. This is known. Uh, I call it a mixed margin account, but I don't have that as an answer. So I have a combined equity account. No, I'm going to say it's a combined margin account. An investment company registered on the Investment Company Act of 1940, whose specific purpose is to, uh, you know, promote, uh, promote and develop small businesses. Uh, this is very much a test question. Very much a test question. You should definitely know it's not a private equity fund. Private equity funds are not involved. You know, they're very, they're into bigger deals. So maybe when I say that, maybe not. Maybe not. I'm just saying. Maybe I should say I should know that. A growth mutual fund, no venture capital fund. That is very much a test question. So, you know, I highly recommend when you're hitting pause and hitting answering and hitting play, and then, you know, you come back and Dean is talking about it. Maybe you have like a deck of flashcards next to you or your notes and just make a note that Dean said this is testable, right? So, uh, by the way, if you do all the practice finals, I don't think there'll be anything that surprises you. We're doing here a Kaplan final, Ka shout out to Kaplan. But there's, I told you, seven finals. Mine are not diagnostic finals. So mine are based on debrief. I'm not allowed to ask you like what, what was question 35, but I can say like, what were you prepared for or not prepared for? And so mine are more like, you know, trying to share with you things you can encounter 
on the test. You know, I was a, in the Marine Corps. I briefed and debriefed pilots. So briefing them about what threats they might encounter, debrief them when they come down so we can pass it forward. So same thing here, right? Trying to brief you on what you could expect and then debrief. Now, Brian's test geek final, that's on there. And that has very strong correlation to the actual exam. They get a score there. You're going you know, to feel pretty good. And then Kaplan finals, I'm doing them now. Kaplan are a little tougher. So the scores, uh, I would want you in a Kaplan final to be in the 70 range. But anyways, that one's very testable. The Securities Act of 1934. So you can get a lot of questions right by covering up the screen. Are they asking you about paper prospectuses? 33. Are they asking about people and places? 34. And it created the SEC. On a theory, the best gameskeeper is a former poacher. So people and places, secondary market trading, yes. Registration of broker dealers, people and places, yes. The extension of credit, Reg T is a part of 34, yes. Registration of new issues, no. Paper, paper, prospectuses, D is 33. So again, you can cover up the screen. People and places, 34. Paper, prospectuses, 33. All the following would be considered current assets, except. So yeah, we do plan on turning our inventory to cash within 12 months. Cash, yes. Marketable securities, yes. A warehouse is a long-term asset or fixed asset. Uh, be careful. You know, you might have gone for the inventory. Inventory, we can't, is a current asset. But we also have a thing called quick assets. And quick assets would be different than current assets. Quick assets would be the current assets less the inventory. That's not what this question is about. It's just about current assets. Uh, when considering a specific recommendation for a new client, knowing which of the following would be most crucial. You know, the three styles of questions you get on your exam are recognition, things you simply know or don't know, you know practical application. You know, can you do a current yield? And then judgment questions. Uh, judgment questions are the hardest ones, and that's about 10%. And it, everybody's going to miss these. So most crucial is a judgment question. So the client's beneficiary, um, the client's medical condition, risk tolerance, because remember, that's the whole point of coming to the securities markets. You know, how are you going to feel if you lose this money? That's like the introductory question. If you, I had a guy who was thinking about taking money as a client. <laughs> he said, how are you going to feel if you lose this money? He said, I'd kill myself. And I said, wow, you have risk tolerance means you shouldn't be involved in securities. You should talk to your banker about a banking product or your insurance about insurance products because securities products have risk. One of your customers uh, called you with the good news that they're new grandparents. They're looking for a way to provide funds for the new child's college education and would like some kind of a tax break. That's key. Some kind of a tax break. These are another ones where I always miss because I'm prejudicial. And anytime it says kid, I'm always thinking 529. But, you know, you know, that will cause Dean to maybe miss a question, perhaps. Anyways, uh, what would be the most suitable recommendation? What would be the most suitable recommendation? So I'm thinking, again, projecting the answer. I'm thinking either a Coverdale or a 529, uh, maybe a zero coupon bond. That's kind of what I'm thinking here and what I'm looking for uh, in the answer set. All right, so let's see what our choices are. Let's see what our choices are. Uh, start an IRA in the child's name, make annual contribution on the child's behalf. Now, again, I'm looking for a 529 or a Coverdale. Donate money to the UTMA, naming the child. There's no tax break on that. Start a 529. Ding, 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 ding. Now, I like the zero coupon bond, but the key word is it says some kind of a tax break. And where the tax break on the 529 is you can use the money for qualified educational expenses. So that's why C is the better answer than D. Uh, by the way, I should have got that to a 50-50 because I, as I told you, projecting the answer, I'm looking for 529, Coverdale, or zero. When referring to the US stock market, which of the following statements regarding beta is not true? Uh, it is by definition equal to one. Uh, I don't know, I'll put a question mark on that. It serves as a benchmark. Uh, for measuring relative volatility to the market itself. I should not be struggling with that at all. Should not be doing it. Uh, it shows the stock's beta is 1.2 and the market moves five. I can just test that out. I'm going to just take my calculator. Five times 1.2. That is indeed six. So if the stock's beta is 1.2, I'm expecting if the market goes up five, it would go six. It provides a measurement 
of a range that the market may move in any given day. Well, uh, no, it's a volatility as compared to the market as well. So I was kind of struggling by definition. By the way, it's the S&P 500 is what we're using as the uh, benchmark for beta. So uh, given this answer set, uh, I'm going to go for, it tells me what's going to happen on any given day. That sounds like a, uh, certainly my crystal ball is broke. All the following about tax. So CMOs you should know are derivative securities. It's where we carve a mortgage pool into various tranches or cash flows that cascade. And we have plan amortization classes and we have uh, targeted amortization classes. And you should be able to contrast them, tax versus tax. And the buyer is going to have to sign a suitability uh, statement understanding that they're buying. So in exchange for higher price risk, they generally offer higher interest rates. That's, you know, as Chuck, the guy who's in charge of the cubics is actually automatic. Yeah, that's true. Uh, they are the most volatile. Yeah, that is the test question, by the way. All the following are correct, except. Well, they're not the most volatile of all tranches. I mean, they're more volatile in terms of the packs, but we also have Z tranches. Let's see. So A is true. B, I'm kind of, you know, I don't like B only because it's not giving me a comparison tranche. They have a transfer prepayment risk to companion tranches. That's true. And they have extension risk. That's true. So I'm going to go for B just because they didn't give me any other tranches. And there could be, you know, disease. There could be some others. By the way, don't overdose on that. Like I say, it's it's just straightforward recognition questions if you get it on your, your exam. Uh, the purchase or redemption order uh, for the shares of a mutual fund. Remember, you're doing business directly with the mutual fund sponsor. And so it's always going to be based on the next calculation of the NAV. And they're going to have to calculate NAV at least once per business day. So that's kind of what I'm looking at in terms of this uh, question. That's called forward pricing. The net asset value computed uh, at the close of trading the day before the fund receives the order. No, that's, remember, it's always the next calculation forward pricing. Uh, the net asset value computed before the fund. No, the net asset value computed after the fund receives the order. Yeah, that's called forward pricing. An investment uh, investor begins a periodic of payment deferred variable annuity. So you're putting money you've already paid taxes in to a deferred variable annuity. When I think you see variable annuity, I think of mutual fund with insurance wrapper. Mutual fund with insurance wrapper. You know, so anything is true of that is going to be true of the, the mutual fund. So uh, an investor in the variable annuity contract reports no taxable consequences during the accumulation period. Yeah, I, I like that. I like that because remember it says difference from mutual fund. A mutual fund, remember, you're getting constructive receipt. So for example, in a mutual fund, if you have dividend reinvestment program, a drip, you tell the mutual fund, I don't need the dividends from the mutual fund. So just buy me additional fund shares. The IRS says, well, you could have had the money and that's the same as getting it. That's called constructive suite. You're going to owe, commit, uh, owe taxes on that. But a variable annuity, you must reinvest. And so you're not going to have that during the accumulation period. So I like that one, A. Uh, the mutual fund will generally have a surrender charge for early withdrawals. No. There's a minimum guaranteed return with a variable annuity. While there are no guarantees uh, with the mutual fund. Well, no, a variable annuity, there's not a guaranteed return. I mean, it's whatever the separate or sub account does. The variable annuity contract will have lower expenses than mutual fund. No, they have higher expenses. So given that answer set, I'm going to go with A. That's like, sometimes referred to as a non-qualified plan. A non-qualified plan. You should know all money market securities. All money market securities are issued at a discount with the exception of a negotiable jumbo CD. And therefore, that means the answer is A. So that would be true of a treasury bills, commercial paper, uh, bankers' acceptances. Uh, one member of the municipal Senate is opposed to bidding on a particular issue because some of the restrictions outlined in the official notice of sale. So this means it's going to be done on a competitive basis, and the issuer is going to publish a notice of sale in the Daily Bond Buyer, which is a newspaper widely read in the municipal market. And uh, the other eight members of the syndicate have agreed on a price and vote to submit their bid. In this situation, the syndicate manager can do all the following except uh, withdraw from the bidding process. Yeah, 
That sounds reasonable. Submit the bid after reaching a consensus. Yeah. Require the dissenting member to accept their prorated share. No. You know, we can, can't force you to participate in the syndicate. You can leave, but uh, we can't make you do it. Allow members to drop and add new members. Yeah, so. No, we can't force you or compel you to, you know, accept terms you're uncomfortable with. Over-the-counter quote that must be reconfirmed with the OTC trading dealer <laughs> between <laughs> before act takes action. Uh, you know, I don't think on the Series 7 you're going to have to know this, but we have different types of quotes, different types of quotes. And, you know, representative quote, no, that's not a firm quote. Uh, subject, subject means subject to confirmation. Subject to confirmation. That's what that means in English. A uh, firm quote, a firm quote is when I give you a bid and ask. A third party quote, no, that's going to be subject, subject to confirmation. Eh, I don't know. You should know that if it's, again, subject quotes aren't allowed in NASDAQ. This would be a non-NASDAQ over-the-counter stock. Uh, but that being said, on NASDAQ, you have to post a bid and an ask, and all quotes are considered firm for at least 100 shares. And you should know that if you don't honor it, it's called backing away, backing away. I uh, hear the answer is subject. I Low probability. There's no such thing as a representative quote, and there's no such thing as a third-party quote. The only other quote I would be uh, uh, recognized is what's called a nominal quote for informational purposes only. Without any position in the uh, stock, the investor wrote an ABC July 60, call it six. So I have an obligation to sell the stock at 60. On expiration, ABC is selling for 66. So that means I'm gonna have go in the open market. Oh no, it says I'm gonna close for intrinsic value. So the intrinsic value is six. I sold it for six and they said I do my closing purchase. So I did my opening sale at six. I did my closing purchase for intrinsic value at six. And for tax purposes, I have broken even. I have broken even. Uh, John is the annuitant in a variable plan. And Sue is the beneficiary. Upon John's death during the accumulation period, Sue takes a lump sum payment. A lump sum payment. Uh, again, projecting the answer, I'm thinking this is going to be about uh, LIFO, you know, last money's in, our first money's out. That's kind of what I'm thinking I'm looking for. Something along that. Anyways, let's see what my choices are. What is their total tax liability? So John is the annuitant. Sue is the beneficiary. He dies. She takes a lump sum. It is the proceeds minus John's cost basis taxes ordinary income. Yeah, that's the correct answer. Uh, the entire amount is taxes ordinary income? No, because remember, he funded with after-tax money, money John had already paid taxes on. Uh, none of it because it's a life insurance policy. It's not a life insurance policy. Variable annuities aren't life insurance policies. It is ordinary income that has nothing to do with it because it's not a retirement plan. So it's A. I think low probability on your exam, very low probability. As a registered rep, you recommend the pur purchase of ABC Fund Family Corporate Bond Mutual Fund to a customer whose objective is current income. So far, so good. The customer agrees to the purchase and you enter the order. What type of securities has the invert investor purchased? So corporate bonds, uh, what type of securities has the investor purchased? You know, this could be, uh, got to be careful on this. This could be a trick because remember, you're buying common shares of the mutual fund. The mutual fund itself is only issuing one class of equity. So, you know, I'm thinking they might be trying to trick me here. What did you purchase? You didn't buy the bonds, the fund did. So I'm going to say common stock. We may miss that one, but remember, I think what they're trying to test me on here is that an open-end mutual fund only issues one class of equity called common stock, right? Now, I didn't say they can't own bonds as this corporate bond fund does, or they can't own preferred stock. I'm saying they can't issue it. So we'll see if we get that one right. Uh, you should definitely know governments are goofy. Governments are goofy. They're goofy and that they're T plus one. They trade in 30 seconds. Right, they use an actual calendar, so one and two. I need uh, agency debt. Uh, municipal bonds are T plus two, and options are T plus one as well. So I would like to say a government agency debt that would be Fannie Mae, Ginny Mae. I like to say one, two, and four, but that's not available to me. So I'm going to go for one and four. But uh, the government sponsors enterprises. 
Uh, but you should definitely know T bills, T nodes, T bonds, or T plus one, and listed options are T plus one. Uh, which of the following is kept for the lifetime of a firm? Uh, spam is a good uh, thing for this. The acronym spam stock record, not the stocks of the customers, the owners of the broker dealer. That's lifetime. If it's a partnership, partnership agreement, articles of incorporation, that's the A and M, minutes of the director's meetings. The vast majority of brokerage firm records are three-year records. XYZ is uh, preparing a new issue, registration statement. So that means they're going to make their S1 registration statement. They're going to enter a cooling off period, which is minimum of 20 days. We can send out preliminary prospectuses known as red herrings that don't include the offering price. We can accept indications of rent interest non-binding. So 300,000 shares and 200,000 existing shares. So that's a total of 500,000 shares. The offering price is 30 and the underwriters are going to take $2 per share. Uh, that's our 30 minutes. So we've been at it about an hour now. So as I told you, I like to set the little egg timer for 30 minutes. So you can know if you want to hit a pause and come back, you can do so. All right. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, okay, well, the issuer is only receiving, this is called a combination underwriting. And the issuer is selling 300 shares at 30, but they told me the underwriters are taking two. So that's going to be 300,000 shares, right? Because the 200,000, remember, the proceeds there are going to the previous owners. And so I'm going to take 300,000 uh, times the net, the net, which is 28, right? Because the spread is two. And I get 8,400,000. By the way, that would be on the front page of the prospectus, by the way, it would show you you know, 30 and then uh, show you 28 and then the two and then the 30. So investors would uh, know that answer. Uh, the public uh, offering as quoted in the financial press, uh, we always, when we're illustrating mutual funds, we always use the public offering price at the full load. So projecting the right answer, I'm thinking that's what this is probably about. But let's see what our choices are in this question. Uh, the minimum sales charge, no. No sales charge, no, the maximum sales charge, there we go. So, you know, if the NAV is $9.15 and we're charging 10, that's an 85 cent sales load. That's eight and a half percent, that's the maximum. Uh, the latest issue of your newsletter from your firm to subscribes to is especially relevant to one of your firm's investment products. If you decide to send this to clients and prospects, you must disclose no sunlight's the best disinfectant. So they're going to ask me what kind of disclosure needs to be made. Uh, future articles will provide similar discussions and information. The newsletter discusses only those products you have available through your firm. Yeah, we have to disclose third party per, uh, per persons. And so that it's a third party, you know, relevant. It's, if you decide to send it, it's a third party. Eh, I think low probability, very low probability. A corporate bond, I haven't had anybody in a long, long time tell me they've actually, in the actual exam, had to calculate accrued interest. In fact, they haven't been actually even asking for the definition, but accrued interest is what the buyer of the bond pays the seller of the bond. And in terms of calculating accrued interest, where corporates and munis, every month has 30 days. So this is important here because it says it's J and J 15. So the last time I got paid interest was July or excuse me, January 15th. And that was for up to, but not including July. And so that's gonna be 14 days in, uh, that I'm owed in, uh, if I'm the seller in January. I, I'm just gonna show you a shortcut really quickly here. I don't think it's necessary because I don't think, again, you're gonna have to do this. Uh, but if we uh, purchase the bonds on Friday, April 17th, be careful, that's the trade date. We agree to terms. So the 18th, the 19th, Monday will be T plus one. So that'll be the 20th. The 21st is when the bonds are going to settle. March 21st, right? So Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and then Tuesday. So that's settlement. And then I'm going to subtract the last time the bonds paid interest, which was July 5th, or January 15th. And then I just got to remember that every month has 30 days. And so I'm going to go for 96 days. Uh, again, I don't think you're going to have to do that on the exam. Uh, I have a whole lecture on it if you want to do it. It's I, at this point, if I'm redoing lectures, I probably wouldn't even include it.
Uh, I would definitely know that some bonds trade flat, no calculation of accrued interest. That would be zero coupon bonds, bonds in default, and income or adjustment bonds that only pay interest when and if uh, earned. A uh, registered option principal is asked to approve a discretionary order to buy an October 60 put and sell an October 55 put for a net debit of five. So, you know, here you're paying five and the difference in the strikes is five. And so there's no way that this uh, trade can end up making money. This is an uneconomic trade. This is an uneconomic trade. And so what I should do is not approve the order. Oh, well, here we go. So uh, which of the following trade uh, flat without accrued interest? Uh, zero coupon bonds trade flat, no calculation of accrued interest, right? Treasure bonds have accrued interest. Convertible bonds have accrued interest. Uh, certificates of deposit, I can't, you know, I just think it's a great distractor. We don't, you know, really need to know anything about certificates of deposit uh, for the exam, except to know that negotiable jumbo CDs are, you know, uh, money market securities, uh, jumbo meaning more than 100,000, so... And then remember, I told you income and adjustment bonds play trade flat bonds in default. I like that question. Uh, one of your customers exercise a put option. So that means if they've exercised it, they sold the stock. So they've exercised their choice or right to sell the stock at the strike price. The stock is in the customer account and your firm makes timely delivery. The proceeds from the sale of the stock will be paid uh, by your firm by your paid to your firm by so i think what they're getting at here is who is the issuer and guarantor of all options you know the customer says well dean how do i know when i exercise they're going to make good and i said well how do they know you're going to make good i mean you're, what you're asking about is contra party risk and the occ is the issuer and guarantor of all options so they're in the middle so the proceeds is going to come from uh the broker dealer whoever the occ gave the exercise notice to Right, and they do a test question on a random basis. So definitely would know the OCC assigns exercise notices randomly. I would know the OCC is the issuer and guarantor of all options. And so when the broker dealer says, why us? The OCC says random. And then I would know the firm can do random five or another fair method. Uh, which of the following is an automated delivery information relating to the municipal market? Uh, the bond buyer, automated system delivering uh, information, the blue list, Instadet, or uh, Thompson's. Well, the bond buyer is a newspaper widely read in the municipal market. And if we're in public finance, we must subscribe to that because that's where we find out about deal flow. Where is the stuff coming from? Uh, this is an outdated question. I would petition to probably uh, Kaplan to get rid of this. The bond buyer, for purposes of this, is not automated system. It's an old-fashioned publications that's now online. The blue list is what we have an inventory willing to sell. Instanet is the electronic communication network for the fourth market. Um, I would have going to update, if I'm going to update this QID for Kaplan, I would put in Emma. Emma is the electronic municipal market access. So I can't imagine you're going to see anything about that. It hasn't been tested in years. It's one of my pet peeves that people don't get rid of old questions. Index options differ from equity options in which of the following ways? You should definitely know that index options settle in cash and that cash is due T plus one. Remember, that's not true of equity options. In equity options, you have to deliver the stock or the money, depending on what you've done, and the resulting stock trade is going to be T plus two. But in index options, both the index option settles T plus one, which is the same for equity options, and... Uh, they settle in cash. Nobody would play if I had to actually deliver the underlying index to you. That is very, very testable. All the following uh, municipal bonds are callable par, which would show yield to call. So I'm looking at the bond. I'm looking for a bond at a premium. The MSRB says when we sell bonds at premiums, we must quote yield to call. So 6.5% is the uh, bond's coupon. It's the bond's fixed or stated rate of return. It's the nominal yield. And if by basis, that's the fancy word for yield to maturity is seven, that's a bond at a discount. Five and a half at par, nope. Six and a half and my yield to maturity is seven, discount. Five and a half and my basis yield to maturity is five, that's the bond at a premium. 
The most current information on new releases of muni bonds can be found in, again, the uh, bond buyer is a newspaper widely read in the municipal market. A customer buys a limited partnership by contributing 20,000. This is the second time we've seen us signing a non-recourse note for 50. So remember, if it was recourse, the answer is 70. If it's non-recourse, the answer is 20. An arbitration proceeding involving a customer for over 100,000 has been agreed to. In such an arbitration uh, thing, which of the following is true? Which of the following is true? The customer can request that all three of the arbitrators are from the public sector. That is indeed true. Right, that is indeed true. I would know arbitration. The customer has to agree to the process. If they don't agree to the process, we don't open the account. I would know that uh, arbitration awards are due within 30 days. Uh, I would know the statute of limitation is six years. And I would know the reps can't be held accountable for arbitration in regards to HR issues. Other, By the way, when you sign your U4, you agree you're going to arbitration. Uh, smart bear here. This is a very smart bear. So this bear knows that if all they do is sell short a hundred shares at 72 and that's all they do, they have unlimited risk. So I say, I, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to establish the choice to buy back the borrowed stock at five. So I brought in 72 for the stock. Uh, I paid out five for the protection. So I'm net out of pocket. I'm net out of pocket 67. That's my break even. So it's either A or B. Right, I'm just shopping the answer set, and I have two choices. We're break even. By the way, you when you see shares, you've got to stay focused on the shares because that's going to be a different analysis, right? All right, so I'm out 68. I can buy back the stock at 70, right? So let's see, five. I'm out uh, 72 minus five. I'm terrible arithmetic, so I just want to use my calculator here. So 67 is what I'm net out of pocket. That's my break even. And I can buy back the stock at 70. So smart bear that I am, now I can only lose 300, which is choice D. And I think you're a jerk of a customer who goes to zero and you said, Dean, had I not wasted the money on the production, I would have made 7,200 instead of 6,700. I said, well, yeah, but you would have been taking on them at a risk. I would have been foolish. A, a customer buys a muni bond at a premium. So when we buy muni bonds at a premium, we got to do straight line amortization downward. So I'm going to take the $80, 108 is 1,080. I'm going to divide by 16. So 80 is what I'm losing if I hold it over the remaining life. And I'm doing that over 16 years. So I'm going to decrease $5 a year. I've had it for 10 years, so I should have written off 50 bucks. So 50 minus 1,080 is 103. I sell it for 102. I have a $10 loss. This is about 50% probability on the test. Uh, that you're going to have to do the straight line amortization downward. I call that decretion. That's just what Dean calls it. People get upset that I have my own names for things. Uh, I just call it that because straight line amortization upward is accretion and downward is decretion. When interviewing a person uh, to fill out the new account form, a registered rep asks uh, the client a number of questions, which of the following would not be required. Well, we certainly need a physical address, you know, uh, where to send things, which would not be required. We need your name. We need your tax ID. Yeah, we don't need your educational background. There's lots of very smart people who, you know, maybe don't have the formal education. It's, I mean, we can ask it, but it's not required. An investor purchased a 50 put for a premium of four. Um, on expiration, it's selling for 42. So that's uh, bad news. Oh, and that's good news, right? I have a choice to sell the stock at 50. The stock is 42. So, you know, uh, I paid four. So everything's going according to plan here, right? I got to be right about three things. Direction, I'm right on direction down. I got to be right about how far down, at least four points to cover my out-of-pocket cost. I'm right about that. And I got to be right about timing. So, so far looking pretty good. Um, I closed it out intrinsic value. So that's eight. So I did my opening sale for four. I did my uh, closing, uh, excuse me, I did my opening purchase for four. I did my closing sale for eight. So I made $400. So I'm just shopping my answer set. And I don't have a, only one that says 400. Thank you so much. Uh, all options are short term, all short, anything options related to short term. The only option position that may qualify for a long-term capital gain 
would be a, uh, a long a leap. Because remember, leaps technically go out 39 months and practice 30 months. Uh, which of the following statements is true? Uh, reg D. So Reg D's are safe harbors under 33. This is a way to sell securities without registering them. We're selling unregistered securities through Reg D. And that means we can only sell it to accredited investors. We certainly should know the definition of accredited investors and as many institutional investors as we'd like. So it says the amount of capital that we can raise through our private placement is true. Which of the following is true? The amount of capital that can be raised through a private placement is limited. No, we can raise unlimited. So that's not true. Uh, registration with the SEC is not required. Well, they still want to kind of know what we're up to. So registration with the SEC is not required. That is true, right? It's a safe harbor. We're not making a registration statement. We're selling unregistered securities. Yeah, it's not going to be a prospectus. It's going to be... Um, it's going to be a uh, private placement memorandum. Uh, does not require issues to file. Yeah, that's this is why it's called a safe harbor. We're selling unregistered securities. I don't like this particular question, but I would definitely know credit investors. I would definitely know you're buying unregistered stock. Maybe they test you on the difference between 506C and 506B. 506B, I can have up to 35 non-accredited investors and I can't make a general solicitation. 506C, I can solicit. But I can't have any non accredited. Uh, customer shorts an OEX uh, uh, call at seven. So that's an opening sale. The customer is assigned an exercise notice at 944. Uh, this is testing you on do you understand it settles in cash? So that's going to be uh, what, 900? And I paid 700. And it says realizes. So, you know, realizes. So I shorted it at seven. I bought it back at nine, so it looks like I got a $200 loss. Uh, it's for natural wasting resource, right? So, you know, depletion is, I don't know how much of it I have, but I do know this, if I sell it, whatever's in my mine or my, my well, I've got that much less. So this is an incentive for me to replace uh, recover, you know, the oil I pumped and sold or whatever the case may be, right? So um, I would get this right with what I call the Sesame Street trick. One of these things is not like the other. Copper mining, yes, is a natural wasting resource, copper. Real estate is not a natural wasting resource. Oil and gas is a natural wasting resource. Timber is a natural wasting resource. So you don't get a depletion allowance for real estate, but you get it for mining and oil and gas and timber, that kind of thing. Again, as I said, I think most proprietors go way overboard on that. All the following of treasure bills are correct, except, boy, that's an easy one because you should definitely know that treasury bills are not callable. By the way, when you get one like this, you can uh, now say A, C, and D is truthful. And maybe that's information I can use later on. A lot of people call the T-bill rate the risk-free rate of return because we don't have credit risk and we don't have interest rate risk. Uh, marking to market is used to adjust. So I use this term a lot. If you've watched my uh, margin lectures, I say, okay, now we're going to do a mark to market. So we do an initial setup and then we mark to see if the customer has excess equity or SMA or buying power or you know whatever the case may be. The contract price to the settlement price, no. The margin requirement, no. 50%, the maintenance 25 or 30, no. Boom, that's uh, D. Too long to be wrong. Uh, by the way, on the margin, if you can do the initial setup and then a mark, you're going to want a bunch of margin questions because at that point, there's no way to fool you. Uh, the MSRB uh, rules for New York memberships are enforced by. So the MSRB uh, can only publish rules, A rules, D rules, G rules, administrative rules, definitional rules, uh, you should know G37, that's the $250 thing, but they have no enforcement power. So we deny them the enjoyment of enforcement. All they get to do is publish rules. So who enforces the rules? It's the same person always does. It's going to be FINRA. Uh, P.S. If you were a bank, it would be uh, the opposite of the uh, FDIC, the Federal Reserve Board and Comptroller of Currency. Uh, when opening an option account, the customer must approve uh, or must be provided with a oh, very testable, this whole sequence of options accounts, right? 
I think a good way to remember it is Datto 15. Datto 15. What I mean by that is we're going to give you the disclosure document. Then I'm going to go back and try and get your account approved by my ROP. So that's the first thing we're going to do is give you the disclosure document. The characteristics and risks of options. I'm going to get you approved and I call you and say, hey, I got you approved. And within 15 days, the account approval, we have to ba have back to you the option agreement that you read that booklet and you understood it. Uh, they're asking you here, which one of these is not a money market security, right? Treasury notes are two to 10 years. Now be careful if it was a treasury note with less than a year remaining, it would be part of the answer, but don't be bringing stuff into questions uh, that isn't there, right? So you should definitely know treasury bills are, you should definitely know negotiable jumbo CDs are, and repos, ah, repos are where I give you treasury securities overnight and you give me money and then I reverse it the next day and it's a money market. It's called a repurchase. Uh, direct participation program, a general partner, you should definitely know part, partnerships, direct participation programs, also known as partnerships, have general partners and limited partners. Uh, all the following are true uh, is to accept. A key executive makes day to days, yeah. Uh, points the property manager has limited liability, no. Right, the limited liability, general partners have unlimited liability, it's the limited partners that have limited liability. Which of the following would uh, net revenue to debt service ratio be applicable? And they're asking us which one of these is most likely a revenue bond, school bonds or GOs, tax anticipation notes or the meaning equivalent of borrowing against receivables, GOs, the hospital. The hospitals can be financed through user fees and debt service is about revenue bonds. Uh, a municipal bond is purchased at par. So that means you paid a thousand for it. Uh, you uh, oh, issued a part later purchased. Oh, you bought it in the secondary market. You bought it in the secondary market for nine hundred and seventy bucks. You paid uh, the seller the accrued interest. That was the dollar amount of the accrued interest. What is the cost of customers' per, uh, cost basis? Cost basis is simply uh, what uh, you uh, paid for the investment. And the $32 is different than the cost basis. The interest isn't part of the cost base. So this looks like a hard question. It's not, it's 970. An investor opens a new margin account and sells 100 shares a short at 3250. This is stupid, but testable. They love to torment you about this minimum in a margin account of $2,000. Whenever you hear initial transaction, in a margin account, be ready for that trick about the 2000. Now here, Kaplan's being a jerk because they're actually, you know, clouding it by it's a short sale, doesn't matter. The required deposit, half of 3250 is less than two. And so it's gonna be $2,000. That is stupid, but testable. What's the following is not considered when uh, diversifying a mutual bond portfolio. Yeah, maybe I get you some Puerto Rican bonds, and some of your state bonds to diversify you geographically. I'm going to diversify you by quality, low, medium, high quality, get your yield up, create a laddered uh, bond portfolio where we have bonds coming due at all times. We don't buy you, uh, reduce you by price. I don't buy you cheap ones and expensive ones. Now the price would be reflective in the quality, but we don't diversify somebody by price. You can get this right with reduction to the ridiculous. You know, what would it sound like if I said, oh, I diversified you. I got you some cheap stuff and some expensive stuff. ADRs are very testable. American depository receipt facilitates U.S. citizens having exposure to foreign securities. So they're issuing the domestic market on the foreign branch of a domestic bank. The bank has those securities. That's what the receipt is. For. Uh, does not apply to domestic stocks. Very testable. It's currency risk, right? If the foreign corporation is collecting uh, money in pesos or UN or euros, whatever the case may be, you have currency risk. That is very testable. Which of the following uh, choices is similar to the others? Uh, well, one of these is not a credit agent agency. Uh, that is something that says if the issuer defaults, we'll continue to pay the timely payment of interest in principle. In an effort to raise additional capital, what type of registered investment company may issue debt securities? Again, this boy, it's very testable to be able to contrast open-end and closed-end funds. 
And we said, remember, open-end funds cannot issue anything other than common stock. Closed-end funds can. You know, they could issue preferred, they could issue uh, bonds. Remember, I'm not asking what they can own, I'm asking what they can issue. Definitely should be able to contrast open-end and closed-end funds. You're going to get more than one question on that. Uh, I have a nice uh, little, lecture, a little lecture on that called open versus closed. It's uh, 15, 20 minutes just on that because it's so testable. And again, if you think I should link, I don't want to jam up the video descriptions and timestamps with too much stuff, but if you think that's worthwhile, just uh, consider the comments to be a poll and say, yeah, Dean, I'd like the link to whatever the question is about. So my idea is you shouldn't be doing these questions until you've laid the base, right? So I'd be you know, suspicious or I shouldn't say suspicious, I wouldn't want you doing practice finals until you're towards the end of your, your, you know, study plan. You know, people send me questions sometimes. I'm like, you, you need to lay some more base before you jump into questions. Uh, would probably follow a suitable except, well, I told you 529s, I'm projecting the right answers, A, B, C, and D, right? So uh, A, B, and C is immediately comes to my mind and D does not. An investor in limited partnership is generating passive losses. Remember, Passive losses can only be offset by passive income uh, from other partnerships. And so you can get rid of uh, three and four because that's what happens in your portfolio. And so by getting rid of uh, three and four, uh, I know I'm going to take uh, one and it looks like I'm going to have to take uh, one and two. I don't really like two, but I got to take it. You're a social gathering speaking with an individual who's a tenured professor of astrophysics at the state university. She mentions she participates in the school TSA plan. This is very testable, very testable. You should know who qualifies for these. He certainly qualifies, right? Because he's works at a 403B, an educational est uh, establishment. Uh, as training employees, that means she's <laughs> training employees for the TSA. Uh, I don't even know why we would think that would be a right answer. Uh, is a participant teacher? No. Uh, is qualified for additional? No. Uh, there we go. That's very testable. Remember, it's for employees of an educational establishment or uh, employees of a nonprofit. The city of Podunk has an outstanding 25-year maturity issue callable in seven years has been pre-refunded. So what we did is sold some brand new bonds at today's lower interest rate. Uh, we put that into an escrow account. We bought slug state and local government securities. And quoting the general issue, well, we know when they pass the call protection period, they're going to be called. Now, A is better than B. I can't tell you how many people miss this with B. We know it's going to be yield to call, and that's why B becomes a wrong answer. So I don't want to you know, send out negative vibes, but I am allowed to use uh, right answers as distractors, wrong answers, and still mark you wrong if you don't come up with the best answer. And A is a better answer than B. Interest from the uh, which of the following is exempt from state and local taxation except interest income. Uh, you should definitely know that the government-sponsored enterprises like Ginny Mae, Fannie Mae, uh, that those are fully taxable. Those are fully taxable. The other ones uh, may or may not. So treasury bills, the federal government can and will tax me. The state and local cannot. So they're saying exempt from everything except. So you should know the government-sponsored enterprises, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Jenny Mae are fully taxable. You should know that's a CMO, a collateralized mortgage obligation. Tranches is the French word for slice. So it's a slice. It's a cash flow from a mortgage. Uh, blind, whether it's uh, oil and gas or not, is where we uh, raise the money before we identify the assets. So that's what the word blind means. And more risk, more reward, because I'm not showing you actually what we're going to do with the money. Right? So the money's raised without specific property. Yeah, that's exactly it. And after we get the money, we're in a better negotiating uh, place, right? So money's raised without the identification being stated. And the general partner, after raising the money, then goes, buys, in this case, oil and gas, or if it's real estate, whatever the case may be. If your customer invests in a variable annuity and chooses to annuitize at 65, which of the following are true? She will receive 
um, the entire value. No, a dividend means you want to turn it into an income stream. So we need something without one. So that means we're taking two. She can receive monthly payments. Yep. The accumulation unit is used to calculate the total value of the account. The annuity unit's value represents the guaranteed return. So when you annuitize, we turn your accumulation units into annuity units. And then your check is going to go up or down based on the assumed interest rate. And I would be able to kind of know what the assumed interest rate is. So two and three is going to be the right answer. Then moving forward, we're going to turn the accumulation unit into an annuity unit. And then you have to know how it's going to go up or down based on the year. So two and three. Uh, 10 percent bond the bonds convertible 25 again the minute you get the conversion price you need to establish the conversion ratio so a thousand divided by 25 conversion ratio is 40. Uh, you got to do that right out of the gate it's quoted at 90 parity of the stomach cock so i'm going to take 900 and i'm going to divide by the 40 shares and i say if we turn this into stock we be turning it into stock at 2250 parity is when the stock price and the bond price are equal. We're now at, at 90 minutes. And these do come in at a little over 90 minutes. So we see if we can get this done. And then remember, you can always take a break. Boom. Let me reset it. Boom. Um, so uh, 22 and a half is what you're paying for the stock. Whether that's a good idea or a bad idea, it depends on where the stock's at right now. Uh, I can't imagine you're not going to have to do a calculation of parity once or twice. So. Make sure you're cool. It's either going to be parity of the stock where we divide or parity of the bond where we take the 25 shares times the market price of the stock. Which of the long statements regarding margin calls are true? So the margin call is the call for initial money, right? So you buy a thousand shares at 40. I'm the margin clerk. I say you want to do this in your cash account or your margin account. In your cash account, your margin call is 40,000. In your margin account, it's going to be half of that. It'll be 20,000. So which of the following is true? Customers are entitled to an extension of time. Well, no, I can sell you out once you've failed to, uh, you know, uh, pay. So you're not entitled to it. I mean, we can request it. We request it T plus two plus two. We don't tell customers this, but they get an additional two days to come up with their money. So one is not true. Uh, by the way, two means it is true, right? So two is true. Customers are not entitled to an extension of time. Firms can sell the securities out in your margin agreement. We tell you that we can sell you out. And so it's two and three. Now, remember, once I sell you out, that means you bought and sold without paying for the buy. And so if you don't pay us for the buy before we send you the money, that's a free ride. Uh, which of the following would give a bearish sign to a technical analyst? You should definitely know that a head and shoulders pattern is a signal of a reversal. And a head and shoulders pattern is a signal, an end of the bullish trend and a beginning of the bearish trend. So uh, what to the line would give a bearish signal? A head and shoulders bottom pattern. So we have, it's actually called an inverted head and shoulders, but, you know, again, Kaplan, I think is kind of being a jerk here. So we need to shop the rest of our answers to see if perhaps, you know, uh, bottom means inverted. In which case it would be the end of the bear and beginning of the bull. So a stop dropping below its resistance line. Mm. An increase in odd lot purchases. So odd lot trading theory uh, says that odd lotters are usually wrong. An increase in the short interest is certainly uh, bullish. That's called the short interest theory. Well, I, I, I certainly don't like this answer set. Um, I, you know, I like B and I like C and I'm not sure what that is. I'm going to go for the odd lotters are wrong and increase. And so the odd lotters are buying and think the stock market is going up then it's probably going down. So I'm going to go for that one. Uh, safety of principle, GO muni bonds are considered second only to, boom, right? Because they can confiscate money like the U.S. government. They don't have to deliver products and services at excess of raw material and labor. So munis are considered the second safest form of credit. Uh, Munis do go bankrupt, but nowhere near as many uh, times as corporations do. Investor established margin account with 24,000 short market value, credit of 30. The maintenance call will be. So uh, I'm going to figure out what the equity is. So uh, 30 minus 24 is six. And then I got to have 30% of the market value. 
which is uh, 24,000. So we'll take 24,000 times 30%. That's 7,200. But remember, I already have 6,000 in the account. So the call is the difference between what I need and what I got. So if this would have said, what is maintenance? It would have been 7,200. 30% of 24 grand. It didn't say what is maintenance. It said, what is the call? The call is the difference between what you need, 7,200, and what you got, which is six. And maintenance calls are due promptly. Uh, American style options trade on the SIBO are priced higher than European style. Having the same because, well, the reason is, remember, American style, you have more risk as the short seller. If you're short the option, it's American style. Anybody can exercise any time. That's more risky. And European style, remember, they can only be exercised at expiration. So that's going to be why, uh, because of that. So we're looking for an answer that says that. American style options can be exercised anytime until expiration, while European styles can only be exercised at expiration. Yes. That's the, why they have different pricing. European cannot be traded out of. That's false. European style are not adjusted. False. U.S. investors cannot know. A. Definitely would know the difference between those two. Uh, reverse split. So I'm going to have less shares at a higher price. So the whole point here is to have the market price go up. It's embarrassing, but that's it's not bueno that we're doing a reverse split. <laughs> so one is true. Uh, market's going to go up. The number of shares outstanding goes up. No. Uh, the earnings per share goes up. Well, again, we have the same earnings, but we have less shares. So market cap of the company uh, goes up. No, there's no change in that proportion. So I need one, and I'm going to say one and three. All the following are characteristics of 529 plans. Uh, I would have a general understanding of uh, both uh, 529s and Coverdale, uh, Coverdales on the test. And uh, the 529s are more testable than are the uh, Coverdales. But here's a Coverdale question. Uh, there is no age limit. All the following are true. There's no age limit on the beneficiary when looking for something that is false. The donor income limits apply. Uh, the assets can be transferred to a family member if not used by the original beneficiary. An official statement that munis are exempt from 33. So we use when selling municipal securities. The MSRB says a 529 plan is a municipal security. Um you may not be able to deduct it, but there's not an income limit. It is means tested. I don't really like this question. Oh, excuse me, 529s. I was thinking Coverdale. So yeah, that's the advantage of the 529, right? Uh, I saw what President Obama, when he was uh, president, said he's funding these for his daughters. I know what President Obama makes, three, dollars $400,000. There is means tested on the Coverdale. That is a testable distinction. A client who's a manager of a large pension plan has recently changed the portfolios waiting from 80% equity 20% fixed income to 40% equities. Wow. So, you know, he's changing that asset allocation model. 40% short-term treasuries, 20 cash. Wow. This is most likely considering the market is uh, bearish, right? I mean, if you that's a huge change in asset allocation. All the following statements regarding a limited partnership subscription agreement are true, except. All the following are true, except. So this is how we're going to invest in a, uh, a partnership. The general partner's signature grants the limited partners the power of attorney to conduct partnership business. Absolutely not. This ends up being an easy one. Right? You should definitely know limited partners do not make those decisions. Uh, B, the investor's rep has verified the information. Yes. General partner endorses that you're acceptable, you've been accepted. I used to use this when I was selling partnership because, hey, you've been admitted. You woo -hoo. The investor signature indicates he's read the obvious. So, hey, that's a pretty easy question. Uh, double barrel bond is a municipal bond where if the user fees are insufficient, uh, the municipality will pay it through property taxes. So it's a hybrid. And it's, remember, going to require voter approval because there is stickiness uh, to the issuer. So double row means two promises. The first pro promise is a user fee, and the second pro pro promise or pledge is the uh, uh, full faith and credit of the municipality. Uh, a bond that is exempt from federal and state taxes? No. A bond of a foreign issuer? No. 
a bond that has the principal and interest backed by the revenue of a facility and the general taxing authority of the municipality. Absolutely. If I ask on the test what that is, it's a GO bond. Uh, an investor writes 70 calls at three and short 70 puts at one. This is a short uh, straddle. If it had different strike prices, it would be a short combination, but this is a short straddle. You should be able to figure out the break evens, which would be three and one, 74 and 66. You should know that you want it inside of that. You should know it exposes you to unlimited risk. Yield quotes on CMOs. So you're going to get a couple of CMO questions. They're pretty straightforward. I wouldn't get too in the weeds. Oh my God, the test prep vendors go so in the weeds on uh, CMOs. Uh, are based on the underlying mortgage's maturity. Well, we don't know that because remember, we're carving it up. The average, now if it was just a straight mortgage pool, B would be true. The underlying mortgage's interest rate, no, the cascading cash flow, how long it's going to take you to get that. So it's D. I think that's very low probability. It's mainly, can you tell the difference between tax and tax, suitability statement, that kind of thing. A customer, a company very concerned about liquidity would want, <laughs> this is kind of weird, um, weird way to test you on current ratio. So PE is about the market, not the company. And the current ratio is the current assets divided by the current liabilities. And so if I'm concerned about liquidity, I want to have a higher rate of cash, current assets to current liability. So I'd want a higher current ratio. Kind of a funky way. I think you should understand current ratio. I'd be surprised if they actually tested that way. But a uh, customer has an investment objective of keeping pace with inflation while assuming a moderate risk. Which of the following uh, would best meet the customer profile? So again, you could uh, do this by process of elimination. You should definitely know that we never sell insurance as a security or investment. Life insurance is life insurance. So that's out. Variable life insurance, best case, you end up with a self-funded insurance policy. IPOs are out in terms of suitability. Money markets are out. So I don't really like this, but by process of elimination, my best answer is D. In a margin account, your customer has a market value of 22 and has a debit balance of eight. He enters an order to purchase $12,000 worth of stock. So I think he's got some excess equity, some SMA that will take care of part of that purchase. So I'm going to take the uh, half of the 22, right? So half of 22 is 11. Uh, well, let's get the equity first. So 22,000 uh, minus 8,000 is uh, equity of $14,000. And so that's 14. And half of the 22 is 11. And so I said, you have $3,000 in excess. That's SMA. So you can have that uh, to either have as cash or twice that can buy security. So your SMA will take care of six of the 12. And so that means now we're talking about the remainder, which is six. And you're going to have to give me half of that. So it's going to be $3,000. All the test prep vendors go way, way overkill in margin. It's mainly just understanding the classical margin equation, long market value, 22, minus debit, 8 equals equity, 14. And then understanding what is the excess equity. So who knows? I might even miss that one. Uh, DCAF, a corporation has declared a 10% stock dividend. I would definitely know that stock dividends are not taxable. Cash dividends are. I would definitely know that you end up with a uh, lower, uh, more shares at a lower cost base, right? So uh, which of the following is true? The stock dividend would increase the cost basis per share. Well, no, actually it's going to lower, right? Because you have more shares now. Your cost base is the same, but you have more shares. So it's going to decrease. Uh, decrease the percentage ownership. No change in proportion ownership. The stock dividend would not be taxable. That's true. Boom, right? Cash dividends are taxable. Stock dividends are not. Uh, again, the most detailed information about a municipal bond uh, would be found in the equivalent of the uh, prospectus. But here we have the notice of sale. Certainly not in that. The legal opinion is done by the bond council. By process of elimination, I'm going to say the bond resolution. 
because it's the only one I would prefer to have here, the official statement, but the bond resolution, actually, the trust indenture gets more into that. So B, B. A customer gave written authorization, may permit a register rep to exercise his discretion as to, you should definitely know you don't need it for time and price. So you need it for action, ask that amount. So asset, Roman number one, and amount, Roman numeral three. Very testable. Uh, Ms. Bond rated uh, triple B as pre-refunded. Which of the following statements is true? Well, if it was triple B before it was pre-refunded, well, now it's going to be triple A because they owe the money, but they have it in an escrow account, right? So, you know, once they pass the call protection period, they're going to call the bonds. So the funds required to met de debt servicing have been set aside in an escrow account. True. The market value will decrease. No, no, that's not true. Yeah, actually, it's more liquid now because it's, you know, it's uh, been upgraded from triple B because they have the thing. So B is not true. The rating will increase. Yeah, it goes to triple A. It's now backed by those state and local government security slugs that are U.S. government securities. Yeah, that's true. So B. What action could a corporation uh, take that would result in the forced conversion of an outstanding stock, uh, convertible? So, you know, an offer you can't refuse, right? And the way you're going to decide this is, based on the money again, right? So the way they're going to force it is by saying, okay, what do you want? Do you want your money or do you want the stock? And they're going to make sure that the stock ends up being the choice you're going to take. So uh, exercise the conversion feature when the debt security value exceeds the call price. So exercise the conversion feature. No, the conversion feature isn't exercised by the issuer. It's exercised by the convertible debt holder. And so you're going to have to compel them to do it. They can make them do it, but you're going to make it be foolish if they don't. So exercise the call feature when the debt securities conversion value exceeds the call price. There you go. So I say, okay, well, we're going to offer you 105 and the stock's worth 110. You say, well, gee, I'm going to convert. I say, thank you so much. All right, reduce dividends. No, reduce coupon. No, like, those are already set in stone. Uh, which of the following factors does not affect the marketability of a municipal bond? Block size does because the bond desk that buys and sells munis, uh, you know, you can call it, you know, irrational, but they don't like buying three bonds. I like to buy blocks of 25 or, or 50 or 100, whatever the case may be. Uh, rating definitely affects that. Call protection affects that. Commissions do not. That has nothing to do with the bond. That has to do with the firm. A combination, remember, is a straddle with different strike prices. You don't do anything differently here. So you're going to combine the premiums, three and three and a half, or six and a half, and you're going to add it to the call. So the call is 45. So 45 plus six and a half. My upside bring even is 51 and a half. So I need Roman numeral three. So that means it's either B or D. And then I'm going to take it and subtract it from the put. And the put is 50. So 50 minus six and a half. And I get 43 and a half. So it's 43, it's one and three. Again, should be able to identify, calculate the break evens, determine where it's profitable. When do you use it? An investor has received a cash dividend on a stock that they've owned for over 10 years. It is the first dividend the company has received or company has paid. The cash dividend would be taxable to the investor. Well, uh, again, so this is now a company that uh, no longer needs all the money to build the business. It's a sign that they're becoming a mature, stable business. And so a long-term capital gain, no. A short-term capital gain, no. Capital gains are what comes from buying and selling the security. And the question is asking us about the income we're receiving from the security. And that's different, that's different. A return of your principal? No, it's going to be income in the year that it was received. D. Uh, requires, uh, which of the following requires an actuary? Yeah, well, we got to figure out what we're going to owe. They, what they're asking you here is which one of these is the employer uh, responsible for the investment risk? You don't need an actuary because in profit sharing, defined contribution or 401k, it is whatever it is in terms of the investment risk assumed by the employee. 
But in defined benefit, that risk is assumed by the employer. So D, so the actuary will tell the employer how much money they need to be invested at such a rate to make good on all the promises. An investor with no other position buys a CDE May 65, put it three and a half. If he exercises uh, and buys the stock at 63 and a half. So I buy the stock at 63 and a half and I stick it to somebody at 65. So I'm going to make one and a half points there, uh, but I paid three and a half. So I'm going to lose two points. I got a $200 loss. Uh, some limited partnerships uh, provide tax credits. This is very testable. It's one in four. Rehabilita rehabilitation of historic properties and government-assisted housing. A credit is a dollar-for-dollar dollar whack out of your tax bill. All the following statements regarding PACs. You do have to contrast PACs with tax. So let's see how difficult this contrasting point is going to be. Mainly the test point is that uh, the PACs have more predictability and therefore lower risk. All right, so let's uh, see. PACs have a more certain maturity date. That's true. Uh, PACs have higher yields. No, because of the predictability, they actually have lower yields. I like this question. Uh, PACs have companion tranches. They do lower than average premium. Yeah. Uh, I think this is a legit, you got to be able to contrast PACs with tax. Woohoo. Uh, so uh, here you have a put spread and uh, the action all takes place between the strikes and so I'm paying six and a half. I'm bringing in 210. So this is a debit spread. And when I have a debit spread, what I can lose is my net debit. So 6.5 uh, minus the 210 I brought in. And that's why I do this, by the way. I lowered my out of cost, uh, pocket cost to $440. And so now that's what I can lose. That's why you do a debit spread, by the way, is to lower your out of pocket cost and lower your break even. All right, so let's see what we missed. Let's see what we missed. A customer buys real estate limited partnership by creating and signing a non-recourse. Uh, beginning basis is, oh, let's see how I missed that. I, uh, not, generally non-recourse basis. Oh, I told you about the mortgage, but I, you know, I guess we were supposed to figure out that this is a mortgage. I don't know. I think that's kind of iffy, but that is a miss on the mortgage, right? Uh, I was thinking I'm telling the partnership to go to the bank and get me uh, get 50,000. All right. Well, that happens, right? That happens. I missed that one. RTFQ. I just made a, a, a lecture on tips, tricks, and memory aids. And one of the big things is read the full question. So Dean missed that question because I didn't read it fully. Oh, right, here's the next one I missed. Let's see. Uh, well, I think I said that right. The options were. Wow, that's that's tough. They're making a dis a distinction. Yeah, I, I'm gonna. I would protest that one. I think I said the options disclosure document, but I hit A, so I don't actually think I missed that one. I think I just hit the wrong button. But that's very testable. I give you the disclosure document, Dato two fifteen, Dato fifteen. So make sure you don't miss that, like Dean. That's bad form on my part. Uh, let's see. Do, do, do. Oh, I think we just did that one. Well, how did Dean miss this one? The customer giving written authorization may permit a registered rep to exercise discretion. Oh, I was on the back side of the question. May permit without giving, without giving. I was on the back side of the question. So I did miss this. Uh, if I don't have written authorization without giving written authorization, then I can make decision about time and price, which is indeed a two and four. Two bad misses on my part. Make sure you don't say it out loud correctly and hit the wrong button. So, you know. All right, let's see. Did I miss any others? That's, th that's three, what's that? Three bad misses from RTFQ. Okay, so I think that's it. Uh, hope you found that helpful. I'm trying not to do too many Kaplan finals, even though Kaplan gives me permission to use their content. You know, this is the seventh practice final. 
I think there's four by me, one by uh, Test Geek, and two by Kaplan. I don't want to turn, I'm agnostic about uh, your study materials. I don't want to turn the channel into a Kaplan channel because it's not. But uh, we're trying to be helpful and the people like uh, doing these practice exams. So this will probably be the last uh, Series 7 practice final for a while in the playlist, unless, again, there's more demand. And if there's more demand for it, I'll do it. Uh, there's lots of questions there. There's also separate practice finals on options, practice questions on options. So there's lots of uh, stuff there for you. All right. So remember, inch by inch, Series 7 is a cinch, yard by yard. Series 7 is hard. Uh, I'm so happy that you're uh, with us on this leg of your testing journey. Remember, when you uh, pass and get the testing victory on your 7, the next leg of your testing journey will be 63 or 66, and we have playlists for that as well. Uh, we have narrative lectures and practice files, the same stuff we have. So remember, inch by inch, series seven is a cinch, yard by yard, series seven is hard, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.